All right, everybody, thank you so much for joining us uh, on this webinar. Uh, first one in a while. I think the last one we did was in, in February, kind of covering CMMC as a whole, specifically level three. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about backup, and I'm really excited to have Daniel joining us today. Daniel spearheaded a lot of the effort in us identifying which vendor we were going to be using once once 1.0 hit the streets and CMMC was released fully, uh, knowing that backup was going to be still one of the requirements. We then kind of went on the outset to look for a an ideal vendor, not only just um, as a whole to meet other compliance requirements, as we'll talk in a little bit, as well as security features, things of that nature. We also needed to find a vendor that could back up Office 365 GCC High, which is obviously what most of our clients are on from a platform standpoint, um, and also too, to be able to back up into Azure government. So nevertheless, Daniel's got 15 some odd years of IT management experience, um, and specifically too, um, Daniel helped kind of spearhead our efforts in identifying ways that we can support our MS P clients uh, that we're providing ongoing IT support for, uh, for from a backup standpoint to make sure that they were covered. And so nevertheless, wealth of knowledge, really excited to have them on uh, with us today. So just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, we're coming to you first off from a, a new stu studio here at uh, Summit 7 headquarters. So nevertheless, uh, hope you like the scenery. But and yeah, so I'll go ahead and roll into the agenda. Yeah, let's get started. All right, awesome. So we're going to go over kind of an intro to CMMC, a little bit of an overview. We'll keep it very short and brief. Most of you folks are probably well-read and versed on that. We'll go over the domain as a whole, recovery, and we'll go over kind of some foundations of recovery. Daniel will kind of cover uh, disaster recovery as well as just backup uh, scenarios. We'll go through best practices and warnings as it pertains to the CMMC requirements do a little deeper dive there. Then we will go through specifically GCC High and Azure government strategy, doing backup of GCC High, doing backup of whatever's on-prem, backup of whatever's is in, in Azure, um, and, and go through various scenarios and talk through that. And then lastly, we'll demo a little bit of what we use from a uh, solution standpoint for our clients as it pertains to backup. So, And then we'll go through some upcoming events and do a little Q&A. So just a high level overview of CMMC, obviously you have domains, processes, capabilities, and then practices underneath that. There are 17 domains. One of them that we're going to obviously cover today is recovery, otherwise known as RE. So they all have good, good little acronyms because we all love our acronyms in the uh, federal space. So getting into specifically there are levels. There's five levels. They are all in aggregate. So if you anticipate needing to be a level three company or level three certified business, then obviously you would need to meet the requirements within level one, level two, and level three uh, specifically. And we'll get into this in a second, but recovery has requirements in levels two, three, and five. We're going to mostly focus on levels two and three, but nevertheless, just a quick snapshot of the practices, 17 within level one, 55 within level two, 58 within level three, uh, 26 within level four, and 15 in level five. And then if you were to bundle all those together specifically to meet level three, you would need to meet 130 practices. And something to note, the reason why we're covering recovery specifically first is recovery is one of the ones that was not in NIST 800-171. So this was an added requirement beyond NIST 800-171 and beyond what was required in DFAR 7012. Though it's obviously always been a best practice to back up uh, what you need, what you, what is critical to your organization to keep you operational, uh, let alone what's important to the government as well and the data that you handle for them. So getting into the recovery domain, right here, as you see on the slide, there are level two, three, and five requirements specifically covering levels two and three. Uh, starting with level two, regularly perform and test data backups, protect the confidentiality of backup CUI at storage locations, and then the level three requirement, regularly perform complete, comprehensive, and resilient data backups as organiza organizationally defined. Some of the things that got uh, taken out of this, and we'll talk about this some more later, is there used to be a requirement that they be off-site and offline. Uh, and that's still not necessarily gone away, but uh, some of that's taken out. And some key words that we're going to focus on later are testing, your backups being comprehensive, uh, resilient, 
and obviously protecting the confidentiality or just quite frankly, protecting the backups that you have in terms of access to the backups. Are they encrypted uh, at rest as well as um, in transit? And when the, the uh, whatever mechanism that you're using to back up, um, is that, uh, that transfer of data also encrypted as well or protected? So uh, let's see here. Let's go ahead and get into some foundations of recovery. So I'm going to hand it over to Daniel, and he's going to kind of discuss why it's important to have internal conversations first. Uh, and this is more written policy that we're talking yeah. about that reflects the technical requirements. But what are the things that we need to meet as an organization and think through, not just as a whole, because obviously depending upon your SharePoint data, let's say, and what is housed in SharePoint versus personal data that users have on their OneDrive versus um, some SQL database that's running in Azure that is internal to your organization that, you know, is running some sort of internal workload uh, to your accounting system, to some software program that you're developing uh, for the Air Force, let's say, that's a, a training software, for instance. And, and if you're housing any of that data or processing any of that data, um, what how, what does your backup strategy need? How does it need to differ um, depending upon what kind of data we're backing up? So, Daniel, you want to go and handle that? Hello, everybody. It's, uh, it's nice to meet you. My name again is Daniel, and I wanted to talk a little bit about the backup aspects individually and really understand a policy perspective behind what these are. So the top one, the first one we're going to go over is your recovery point objective. So recovery point objective is when in, the, when in time do you want to be able to restore data from? And so if you look at that and break that down a little bit, a SQL database, you know, you might run a backup on a SQL database every hour, right? Because the data put into that database could be incredibly valuable. And so if you lose that data, it'd be, you know, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars to replace. So that's an important kind of point to capture. Uh, the next one being recovery time objective. So the time from a disaster striking to the time that you can actually recover that data, what is that time span that takes place? And not only that, but, you know, your, your executive team will want to understand how much money are we losing during that time, right? If it takes two hours to restore, what's the loss uh, expected from that? And so that's another good uh, concept to understand is your, is your RTO. And the reason that is, is obviously a lot of it is risk-based. A lot of it is, uh, comes onto the, the data owner itself. And so it's really important to identify each industry or, sorry, each uh, department in your organization mm -hmm. and understand what data they're using and how often it needs to be backed up from a risk perspective. Um, because if HR data get, gets lost or, you know, IP gets lost, that is hard to replicate. Um, those are important conversations to have on the front end rather than during the disaster itself. And the last one is the retention period. So the retention period is how long do you plan on keeping the data? Now, there, there's a kind of a fine line here that you want to be very careful of. Contracts could call for seven years worth of data retention, whereas some other stuff, some other you know, intellectual property, for example, you might only want a three-year retention. And that comes into liability at the end of it, right? So if you get uh, subpoenaed or anything like that, you have to actually provide that data uh, to lawyers in order to be investigated. So it's really a protection point there. And it's incredibly important to make sure those lines are very clear and those documents are labeled appropriately. If you look at this slide here, RPO, Recovery Point Objective, is how frequently do you want to be backing up your data? So there's a, a client that I previously worked at or worked for that uh, they had some SQL databases. We didn't quite understand the severity of, of how often it needed to be backed up until we had a conversation with the data owner. The data owner was saying, for every hour that this is down, we lose $10,000. Our, our company loses $10,000 which is a crazy number, right? You know, some, some of the people watching here, you might think that's a huge number. You know, you might think that's a really small number depending on the size of the corporation, but regardless, it's the principle behind it. Having the conversation with the data owner, understanding that 15 minutes of losing data is thousands of dollars to that specific organization. And so going around to each department, understanding, okay, you know, this critical line of business application, we need to be able to back up SQL every 15 minutes, every 30 minutes, whereas maybe the OS level itself, maybe the Windows server, the Linux server can only be backed up or only really needs to be backed up once a day, right? And so making that kind of clear line in the sand of, okay, how frequently do I need to back up? And, you know, what's the impact if I don't back it up that frequently and understanding the risk and presenting that risk because backup software can be expensive. Mm -hmm. um, setting up backup policies, testing restores, um, times invested in all of that. And so it's really important as, a, as an IT specialist, as an executive level 
to have those conversations with data owners to make sure that everything is, is appropriately uh, uh, scheduled out. And then the next part there, if you see kind of in the middle is our critical event, right? So something happened. Um, ransomware, for example, is, is, is relatively common. So ransomware strikes these servers. I mean, it's, it's bad, right? Servers are down, employees can't work. Now starts the clock, right? So now we have a, a, a timer going on how long is it gonna take us to restore that data? So your point in time is how, how, how far back can I go to restore, right? So every 15 minutes, for example, if it's SQL. And then how, the RTO is how long is it gonna take me to restore that data? Another very important um, concept, right? Because you need to know how long is it gonna take to restore the SQL database? Is it gonna take 30 minutes? Is it gonna take an hour? Okay, what's the expected loss from that, right? The downtime between the time that you can uh, start the restore process and finish it and put it back in production. So again, that's a really core concept to understand because you wanna make sure and you wanna be able to present the risk to your leadership and, and tell them, you know, based on, based on what the data owner told me, I'm taking backups every 15 minutes. This backup will take, you know, one hour to restore back to production. The total risk associated is, you know, us losing $7,000 if this application goes down. And that ties into other aspects like going into high availability and some other, you know, different types of items to keep that data uh, up as long as possible. Yeah. And you <clears throat> talked about internally, especially in the contracting world, you know, everything can vary contract by contract, yep. can vary depending upon business unit by business unit. Um, you know, you, you have a training and uh, simulation arm of your business, you know, that element of your company uh, may may have way, way, way higher um, expectations when it comes to RPO and RTO. Absolutely. Um, and so you, you may even have to get your contracts management involved uh, to really understand what's unique to each contract and each um, each contract vehicle, et cetera, uh, to really understand, how, you know, what's the best approach for each, each workload that you have. Yep. Okay. So let's go ahead and start getting into best practices and tease some of this out a little bit. So we're going to go over those key words that I talked about that are pulled rather directly from the requirements or uh, pulled from the explanation uh, and descriptions that are further in the appendices of the CMMC documentation. So first off, we're going to go over testing. What does it mean to test backups? Uh, what does it mean to have a comprehensive backup? Uh, what does it mean to have a resilient backup strategy? And also, too, what does it mean to protect confidentiality or protect your backups? And then kind of lastly, even though it's going to be third in our kind of agenda, is compliance. So that's not necessarily pulled, pulled from the requirements. However, um, it, it would be negligent for us to come up with a CMMC backup strategy that also didn't take into right. account D47012 and the requirements you have there. If you have ITAR data, what are the requirements there in terms of backup, uh, even ISO, and some things that you do operationally from a process standpoint, and how does that affect your backup strategy? So let's get into text, testing. So what we have in front of us, Daniel, is I've taken some snapshots of AppPoint, which is a cloud-based uh, SaaS application okay. To run, to run backups of specifically Office 365, GCC High, um, and a little bit of a dashboard there showing uh, a specifically, you know, Exchange Online being backed up there and the kind of the status of a job. And then over to the right-hand side, uh, depending on, I guess, your orientation, the right-hand side, you have an Azure backup screenshot of, you know, backing up uh, specifically some VM or, or what have you. Can you speak to going beyond just obviously checking to whether or not a job works, which also to you probably should have some sort of alerting whether or not a job fails and that kind of thing, and maybe even some redundancy as to who gets those alerts so it's not one single point of failure. But, you know, obviously small organizations, you know, may just be one person. But talk to me a little bit about testing more thoroughly than just obviously checking on jobs and whether or not they you know, check a box that they ran and they ran successfully and digging into that more. Sure. Yeah. So there's a couple of things uh, on the left hand side. You can see the app point where it says exchange online and that specific that product specifically is actually backing up our Office 365 GCC high instance. So that's looking at your workloads like SharePoint and Teams um, exchange online. Right. And so when you do a backup like that, you're probably looking for maybe single file integrity, right? So you're looking to maybe restore an email. You're looking to maybe restore a SharePoint document library and make sure that all the files there um, are as they should be, right? The integrity is there, the job uh, restored correctly, and then you can move on with your testing to something else. On the right-hand side is your Azure Backup, Azure Recovery Vault, really. And so what that is, is backing up multiple or single VMs. And then there's some alerting notifications down there where you can trigger emails, 
Um, there's a Power BI integration, so you can actually have a, your own backup dashboard if you're really interested in what your recovery vaults are doing. And it's really just a quick snapshot of, okay, how are my backups doing? Um, when did it take a snapshot? You can set your schedule and do all of that to it as well. And so Azure makes it really easy to do a single restore, MapPoint does as well, um, just to be able to test to make sure that the VM does restore successfully. And then you can end up assigning you know, uh, IP addresses to it, network adapters, things of that nature to actually log in and test if you'd like. So from a recovery perspective, Azure and AvPoint actually do a very easy job um, of being able to understand and show you, okay, what's up, what's not working, what is working, and then kind of get you on the rest of your day, right? Because no one likes just checking backups all the time. So. That's correct. That's correct. So, um, you know, here in a little bit, we're actually going to do a, a small demo of AvPoint and that, that product. And also, too, we'll kind of get into what does Office 365 do for you yep. already, uh, specifically from a disaster recovery standpoint, um, and what are the limitations? Why do you even need a product like AppPoint, things of that nature? So let's go ahead and get into comprehensive. So just to talk to the slide for a second, then I'm going to kind of hand it over sure. to you to explain a little bit further. So when we talk about a comprehensive backup, that's meaning everything that's in your data estate that if rendered inoperable or you were to lose it altogether, what have you, or there were to be any downtime experienced um, from, uh, you know, on that specific workload, you know, what would be the impact on your organization? And if it would have any sort of significant impact, and especially, especially regardless of impact, if it has CUI right. or intellectual property or any sort of company proprietary data, it needs to be backed up in some way. That's what the requirement really speaks to. And so in the graphic you see here, obviously you have CUI and intellectual property IP that can be stored on a myriad of places. Um, and those, those places, if you will, uh, those, those data stores need to have um, some, some element of a backup strategy behind them, um, no matter how small or big of an implementation that may be. So go ahead and talk to me a little bit about um, the nuances of backing things up on-prem, backing things up in the cloud, um, and how to make sure that, I guess, a, a company's strategy ha is comprehensive in, in terms of data. Yeah, so it's really important to understand what you need to be backing up. I think I talked about this a little bit earlier with data owners. And so as we're kind of working through this chart at the bottom from endpoints all the way up to on-prem, um, there's some, some really interesting points and conversational pieces that need to be had. So for endpoints, for example, uh, I had a friend of mine reach out to me that uh, manages IT at another organization, and he was telling me that a user had shipped their laptop back after they were let go because everyone has been working remotely and had wiped the system completely clean. <laughs> Nothing on it. It had IP on it. It had specific code that he was working on that is now potentially lost. And so your first, your, your immediate first step is you need to understand what on the workstation or the endpoint needs to be backed up and what needs to be stored in the cloud or a different type of storage account. You know, that could be a network share, for example. Um, that could be OneDrive for business, right? There's a myriad of different options there and what that looks like. And so really kind of a clear cut definition and that when you're onboarding users, they understand what they should and should not be storing on their workstation. That is step one in understanding kind of what that is. Um, the next two are subscriptions and IaaS. Again, it's really important to make sure that the data that you're storing there is data you want to back up. Um, honestly, like some people have too much data that they're backing up, mm -hmm. right? More liable. We talked about retention policies earlier. It's good to have a really clear understanding of what you're backing up, how much you're backing up, and to make sure you're actually not backing up too much. And so when it comes to subscriptions and IaaS, um, it's really a good kind of exercise to look at, okay, we're backing up this, you know, maybe this user archive mailbox, it's been 10 years old, five years old, whatever that might look like. Mm -hmm. um, the other piece of that, if you look at subscriptions and IaaS, and we find this a lot when it comes to shadow IT, people are actually backing up data's, data to Dropbox and Google Drive when that might not be a corporate application that you're actually using. And so shadow IT can actually kind of appear in the background. You can lose data, um, that way. So that's another thing to also be aware of, locking that down. Make sure no other third-party applications, file sharing services can be used to share and then back up data somewhere else. Very important. And the last one is on-prem. So on-prem, you know, workstations, we talked about a little bit, subscriptions and IaaS, on-prem, specifically around servers. Um, it's, again, important to understand what file shares need to back up. 
uh, talking to the data owner to make sure you're backing them up appropriately and the retention policies are set correctly, and then not backing up too much data, right? So having a very clear scope on uh, the OSs that you're backing up, the VMs you're backing up, what those policies are, and have them documented, right? Is it once a day at 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock? Okay, that's great. Let's move on. Okay, what's the restore procedure for that um, specific data set you know, after, after a disaster occurs. And so looking at that kind of that wide breadth of different backup solutions and different backup endpoints, you know, from workstations all the way up to servers, it's really, really important to have conversations because it really comes down to risk, right? When you're backing up data, you're either backing up data um, to be able to restore in the case of a disaster or some maybe malicious intent, um, or, you know, potentially you're having to back up or restore data from, uh, because you're getting audited, right? You need to be able to produce evidence um, in a particular case. And whether you have or have don't have that evidence is gonna be important to your legal team, um, depending on what the case is. So it's very important to, uh, to understand every form uh, of file and folder and, and application and data that you're backing up across every platform. You know, it's interesting you brought up <clears throat> going back and, and looking at the backup data and, and what sources of data you're, you're backing up. And somehow, or not somehow, and in some ways it may be overkill or um, basically you're losing money by backing up stuff Absolutely. that you just don't, you don't need. Um, so not only is it a, a fiscal responsibility to kind of go back and look at these from a, from a CMMC standpoint, this is a maturity model. Yeah. And part of it is processes and part of the process piece is going back and looking at some of these things on some sort of regularity to see, okay, where are we, where are we losing money? You know, yep. um, at the, you know, not only does it affect your pocketbooks, but also to, uh, you know, it, it just makes no sense to back up some of these things when you don't have to. Well, especially when you're looking at the cloud, right? I mean, the cloud charges a very clear cut number based on a, usually a gigabyte model, right? And so if you're retaining data for an extraordinarily long amount of time, like the Azure backup default policy is 10 years. Well, if you're, you know, backing that up, you know, went truncated every year, that's a lot of data. Yeah. You're going to be charged a lot of money. So, um, your boss, your owner, CEO, president will be very happy if you kind of dive in a little bit, understand, and actually save some money. That's good. That's good. So if it's cool, I, I, let's go ahead and jump into compliance as well. So I, I mentioned this kind of at the beginning, but from a compliance standpoint, when when you look at the requirements of CMMC, what predicated that a little bit was DFAR 7012. And in DFAR 7012, Correct me if I'm wrong here, but nevertheless, there's there's uh, requirements on if you're using some sort of cloud service yep. um, that there's going to be requirements as to where your data is stored. Um, specifically, once you start getting into ITAR, then it's important as to who is handling your data mm -hmm. um, and how that's being even reported. And then also, too, from an ISO standpoint, from a process maturity standpoint, there's certain uh, ways that you're backing, uh, backing up your data uh, that need to be considered from a process standpoint. And also, too, with DFAR 7012 uh, and ITAR, you know, there's data residency that gets into yeah. it. And then also, too, as, you know, as we uncovered, going through backup vendors, uh, there's certain vendors that don't meet these requirements. Right. So maybe, maybe even just speak to some of that process. Just You don't have to get really into Office 365, GCC High, and all sure. the nuance of that. But just in just picking a backup vendor that's cloud-based... Um, or even even not not cloud based something on prem that's doing doing backup. Jobs. Yes, yeah. So it's it's really important to understand where your data is at rest, right? And so when you're looking for an offsite backup, that could be a full kind of um, SaaS solution that you're looking at, right? The application hosted, the the backup storage is hosted as well, or it could be kind of a half and half, right? Maybe you manage the application, but the the offsite storage is stored in Azure Government, Azure Commercial, um, you know. Maybe it's AWS, right? Maybe you have uh, storage or maybe it's replicating through another to another data center. So it's really important to understand specifically when it comes to cloud storage, right? So DFAR 7012, uh, we need to make sure that the data, the CUI data that is protected is stored in a federate moderate data center. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of checkbox number one. So kind of going through this with you, Office 365 commercial, just so you're aware, is a federate moderate equivalent, okay? Moving into the, the Azure commercial space, that's actually FedRAMP high. Okay. Then you also have Azure Government, also certified to FedRAMP High. Um, so both good storage target locations. Now, because of some other needs, we usually recommend Azure Government. And I'm going to go into that here in just a second. 
looking at the ITAR piece, there are some very specific requirements around storing ITAR data, not only from an accessibility standpoint, right, for nationals and, and things of that like, but also storing it in a FedRAMP high data center and the requirements that surround that. So Azure Commercial, again, is FedRAMP high. Um, Azure Gov is also FedRAMP high. GCC high, which we, we talk about all the time here, um, is built on top of the Azure government uh, platform. So we recommend just going with that because you're already gonna have a subscription anyways, and it's already doing your identity management which then kind of ropes in a little bit more of, the, of one of the next conversations we're gonna have about role-based access. Mm -hmm. So with ITAR data, um, Azure has um, RBAC roles, role, uh, uh, which basically allow you to set certain permission sets and even scope it as small as someone that can review a backup, restore a backup, and perform specific actions like that. And so um, role-based uh, permission sets are really important to be able to really shrink the footprint of who you have accessing your backup data. Mm -hmm. Because if, you know, someone goes in there, they're, you know, domain admin locally, global admin, subscription owner in Azure, they can then go and do whatever they want. And that might not be the best case that you want um, for separation of duties. So. Yeah. Good, good. So let's talk a little bit about resili resiliency. I threw in a little bit of a availability, which okay. I, is not part of the slide, but I, I felt like it was important to talk about that a little, a little bit. So as I talked about earlier in CMMC, the requirement, so hardline requirement in the specifically in the level two and three practices, it used to say that you needed offsite and all, offline backups. Mm -hmm. They took that out and it is now um, kind of interwoven in all of the descriptions um, in uh, one of the level two and level three requirements. And so it's still prevalent. And for that matter, it's it's somewhat, as I understand it, it's a little bit difficult to meet the requirements of resiliency and to have resilient backups if there is not some sort of component of your backups being off the same network that could be compromised and off the same, um, uh, even data, out of the same data center that could uh, be affected in some way, shape, or form or, um, or zone, if you will. So maybe talk, to, talk a little bit about the from an Azure standpoint, uh, what is some of the offsite capabilities or resiliency capabilities within that? And even kind of explain region zones and all that kind of good stuff. Yeah, absolutely. So if you look at the chart here, you can see where it says offsite and a bunch of acronyms underneath it. Um, we're gonna start with LRS. LRS is your locally redundant storage. And what that is is basically a storage account sitting on a server in an Azure data center. Now, if you're in Azure government, that's probably either gonna be in Virginia or Texas, maybe Arizona. Um, there's a handful of additional data centers here in the US. But that's what that means, the LRS piece. The ZRS is, is zone redundant storage. So that's a little bit different. Um, there's data centers close enough to each other um, in, each in, in each specific region. They'll actually replicate copies to each other in that small region, right? So Arizona might have three data centers within a, I don't know, 50, 100 mile radius of each other. And it's actually replicating the data across there. And then the next one is GRS, uh, geo redundant storage. And that's one where it's actually taking a copy and moving it from, maybe it's moving it from Virginia, US Gov Virginia data center to the Arizona or the Texas data center. So it's actually a, a geographical difference in where the copies sit. Mm -hmm. And so it's really important to understand that that's obviously gonna be one of your better options if you're able to do it, it is more expensive. Um, but that way you have, a cop you have two copies that are basically being created across opposite sides of the continental United States. The next one is, is a little bit kind of level up, and that's geo-redundant zone, uh, or geo-zone redundant storage. Sorry, that, that's a mouthful <laughs> on its own, but um, that's doing similar of the past two. And so what that's doing is replicating from maybe uh, Virginia to Arizona, but then it's also keeping three copies of that through the three data centers that are within, you know, let's say 50 or 100 miles of that Arizona data center mm -hmm. um, there. And so that... I mean, you, at that point, you'll have six copies going um, of your data at any given time, which is which is a lot of copies. I mean, that, yeah. that's a lot of data. Um, so usually what we recommend is trying to do at least zone, uh, like zone-based storage, redundant storage, or if you can, do the geo-redundant storage, because that just provides you a couple extra copies, right? Um, and then you'll also have your on-prem copy, potentially, if you're backing up uh, to on-prem storage as well. Uh, um, so yeah, the other part of that is the Azure Site Recovery piece. And so Azure Site Recovery is a little bit more disaster recovery based rather than just uh, maybe just a general backup restore. 
And so what that does is you can actually have your VMs, um, your applications, spin up in a completely another, another data center. Um, that process usually takes about 15 minutes to replicate, and that's going every 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. And then you literally flip a switch, and that data center is now live, and you cut over maybe some DNS records externally and things of that nature to get people back up and going. So it's a relatively quick process um, to go from one environment to another. Um, again, this is all, you know, God forbid some, you know, act of nature, act of God occurs. Right. Um, major power outage. Major power outage, something of that nature. So, And a lot of that's even abstracted to the user. You know, they may, they may log in and experience it as though nothing's different, though their data is now being surfaced to them from you exactly know, another, another data center. Yeah. yeah. So it's really important to understand the, the storage piece, which is that first kind of part that I talked about. And then looking at the Azure site recovery piece, which is more disaster, you know, semi real time, again, replicates every 15 minutes or so um, to another data center across the continental, continental United States. So one uh, little thing to tease out and correct me if I'm wrong here with Azure site recovery, the difference between that and this even gets into some of the nuances of Office 365 and why the native capabilities of Office 365 are not enough to meet these requirements mm -hmm. is it doesn't it doesn't allow you to go back to a moment in time. Exactly. Specifically. So you can do versioning um, with SharePoint, as you guys probably well know. Um, if you delete an account, the account will stay in the deleted items for about 30 days. Yep. OneDrive data, I think you, I want to say you have close to 90 days to be able to restore back from that. Um, but outside of that, it's you get what you get. Um, and so a lot more thought has been put into, okay, how long, again, do I need to keep my backup data? What all do I need to back up? Making sure I have policies around that, which is why, you know, we vetted and recommended um, Avpoint as our solution with GCC High. It's one of the, the few vendors that actually support the platform, let alone provide a really good backup product. Yeah. So talk to me a little bit about, also too, I, we've talked about storage redundancy mm -hmm. and uh, and resiliency of your backups from a uh, technical standpoint. But let's also talk about from a, from a role and account standpoint, hypothetically, let's say uh, one of your admins, your global admins has their, comp their uh, credentials compromised right. or something happens to where an individual that would otherwise be responsible for recovery or, you know, whatever the case may be, how, how you can uh, make your backup process and your backups themselves a little bit more resilient to scenarios like that? Sure. So, I mean, there's a, there's a few things on the Azure side um, when it comes to RBAC, which is um, role-based access control is what that stands for. Mm -hmm. So you can actually, dot, uh, and I think I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but you can actually segment out and give people very specific roles that it comes to backups and recovery vaults. And so it's really important to understand who in your organization should be able to access that. Um, you want to keep that obviously very tight, MFA, things of that nature. Um, and then that way, in case something happens, you do have a backup with a very scoped and specific set of rules that they can go and restore a file. Now, if an account was compromised, you know, maybe you're, maybe you're a small IT shop. Maybe you're the only IT guy um, there in your organization. You don't have a team. You don't have really great separation of duties. We well, can create um, separate accounts and scope those to very specific roles so that when you're using your backup restore account, um, it's not doesn't have global admin access or um, you know subscription ownership level access to the rest of your environment, right? So it's really important that separation of duties is important from a, a, a person base. But if you can't quite do that because maybe you're just one person, you know, least privilege is kind of the other way to swing in that to make sure that you have very specifically scoped accounts to do what you're trying to do without giving you know a potentially future compromised account access to to the whole thing. So. Gotcha. Gotcha. So um, let's also talk about availability, which can kind of bleed into resiliency, but talking through the types of storage and how quickly you can spin up uh, a recovery. I know from an Azure blob standpoint, they have, I believe it's access tiers mm -hmm. or something to that effect. Uh, they have tiers of hot, cold, archive. Talk a little bit about that and uh, the nuance of availability and why you would choose one over the other. Sure. So, I mean, it's really important to understand the type of data you're backing up, how often it will probably need to be accessed or restored from. And that's where it comes into the storage tiers, right? So there's, Sean just mentioned, there's three different kinds with Azure. You got your archival, you got your cool, you got your, uh, you got your hot storage. And so if you look at the pricing uh, model of that, it's actually priced based on read and writes. And so an archival storage might have really low write cost, but really high read cost, 
right? Because it's assuming you won't have to get to that data very frequently. And so understanding, again, the use case of what you're backing up and understanding, okay, how often do I need to actually pull back and, and pull data out of that? So if you're looking for maybe like a VM or something of that nature, you probably want, you know, hot storage. Whereas if you're looking for some kind of long-term long solution, you might want to go with the archival, right? If it's something that you don't, maybe will have to touch once every two years, um, save some money, go with the archival route. Um, the other side of that, which is, is kind of interesting, um, I've worked in the MSP space for a really long time. And uh, I remember at one time I was at a conference and a client was telling me about a backup product they were using that will go unnamed here. Um, but they had either 10 or 12 terabytes of data to restore for a client. And the backup vendor from their cloud solution was throttling them to only be able to restore, uh, it was either 500 gigs, I want to say, or maybe it was even, yeah, I think it was right at about 500 gigs a day. And so it was going to take them forever to actually restore all the data they had. So it's really important, especially when you're vetting vendors, to understand how quick can you get to your data and are there any limitations on you restoring all of your data in case of a disaster recovery situation. So getting into a little bit of uh, protection, which I think is obviously one of the more critical pieces of this, uh, because it's one thing to back up properly. Mm -hmm. uh, it's one thing to uh, have your backups available, uh, but also to, to protect them in a secure manner that obviously doesn't uh, compromise CUI, sure. which was obviously a major crux of, of CMMC and why it was even um, come to be, if you will. So talk, talk a little bit through the slide um, in terms of encryption and, and everything else. Yeah, so I mean, a lot of this we've talked about before kind of in previous slides here. Um, encrypt your backups, right? Data at rest, data in transit, right? Are you doing it over TLS encryption if you're going to the cloud? Um, it's really important to understand that. Is your data uh, at rest actually encrypted? Again, you can use your bring your own keys. You can use Azure native storage encryption if you want to do that. Mm -hmm. It's up to you based on kind of your threshold for security. Um, but regardless, make sure your backups are encrypted both in transit and at rest um, because it has potentially CUI and, you know, if you really look at it, it could potentially have ITAR data in it, which is incredibly sensitive. Um, the next one is you get real-time uh, risk detections. And I think that's more kind of looking at backup failures, right? I need to know when a backup fails. I need to understand what went, what went wrong and how do I fix it. And so, again, Azure Recovery Vaults do provide you a level of notification, email notification. I mentioned earlier you can actually generate a Power BI dashboard out of it, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Um, it's a little, kind of a newer functionality there. Um, and yeah. then... Even weaves in something like Sentinel, right? To be able to... Right. And even that's... Uh, Sentinel will definitely tie in a little bit, especially when it comes to the managed user account compromise piece and looking at the risk events um, for sure. So the real-time detections is, is making sure that, you know, you're notified, you have somebody assigned to work the request. Um, if you need to make changes to the environment, submitting that through a change control board. If you need to back up additional items or remove additional items or remove items, things of that nature. Okay. Um, it's kind of important to understand all, all of that scope there. Next one is, like you said, is the analyze jobs and risk events. Um, tying in products like a, like a log aggregator, um, like a Sentinel, right, a SIM solution, to be able to tie in logs for you know, Azure Log Analytics and, and all of that to track, okay, when are my failures happening? Um, who's accessing my backups, which kind of goes to the last uh, bullet there, the compromise accounts. Um, it's really important to understand um, not only from inside of a maybe a server specific, like a, a Windows server, for example, but also the surrounding environment. In Azure, you know, you have potentially a different identity accessing uh, the high level kind of container of all of your Azure environment. How are they getting in, right? When's the last time that they looked at a backup? When's the last time somebody actually uh, did a test restore of a backup and tracking and being able to show in the logs when all these actions were, were given? And if someone had a compromised account, what did they do in the environment? Did they try and encrypt my backups? Did they try and restore my backups? Um, did they restore my backups? All very good things to keep track of, which Azure, Azure Sentinel does a really good job of. Thanks, Daniel. Let's talk a little bit about uh, some products that you've brought up before. <clears throat> and, and tell me a little bit about how uh, role-based access control mm -hmm. and even PIM, yep. which you can kind of share what that acronym is, uh, how both of those products and even to some nuances to, to subscription and licensing mm -hmm. and, and additional costs that may come into play. But nevertheless, how those two products can uh, lock down access to your backups and things of that nature. Yeah, so it's, it's really important. And again, I take another lap on the RBAC piece to have separation of duties. It's a requirement, right? It's a NIST requirement to be able to say, 
Joe can maybe back up the data, but Susan can restore that. That's super incredibly granular, but you get the concept of it, right? Yeah. Um, and so you can create custom RBAC roles inside of Azure, or you can use some of the backup operator, for example, as one inside of Azure to really scope down the level of access somebody has um, and how the, you, know, you might have four or five recovery vaults. Um, running all different backup jobs and even scoping them specifically to certain recovery vaults to make sure that maybe, you know, Joe can only access the recovery vault for the Huntsville location, which is where we're located, mm -hmm. whereas maybe Susan can only access the one in, um, let's say, Hampton, Virginia. Right. right. So it's really important to, to kind of get that under wraps. And you can have, I, I believe, just-in-time access to where, you know, an individual may only be able to touch um, or, or basically access that data you know, during a, a certain time limit or after a certain approval process, yep. that type of thing. That's where your privilege identity management comes in. You mentioned it earlier. The PIM piece um, is giving in-time access is kind of the whole concept behind it. Um, Azure, I believe you have to have a, a P2 license, actually, an Azure P2 license in order to enable that across your user base. Um, but what that will allow you to do is just in time, break glass type um, and do a change control and a change approval process to get that additional level, level of access that's needed to Maybe, maybe it's to perform a restore. Maybe it's to elevate their permissions for some other feature inside of Azure. Awesome. So let's talk about the glorious Office 365 oh, yes. GCC High. Um, maybe, and this isn't in the bullets per se, but let's talk about Office 365. What comes with it out of the bag, out of the box, uh, that you have from a disaster recovery standpoint at a high level and, uh, and kind of reiterate why uh, the, the native capabilities of Office 365 are just not going to cut it. Sure. So from a disaster recovery piece, um, you know, that's Microsoft's responsibility to make sure that the data center is up. Now, if something goes wrong with the data center, Microsoft, um, you know, kind of holds um, the responsibility to make sure that that c does come back up. There's nothing that you can do in your control to spin up another Office 365 tenant and migrate that that data immediately, right? It's not there's not an Azure Site Recovery equivalent mm -hmm. for Office 365, right? So it really scopes us down to specifically backup. And looking at this, and you can kind of see some of the bullet points here. And, and my apologies if you see me looking up, we actually have a TV behind the <laughs> behind the camera here. Um, is backing up and how long and how often can you back up data? And so we went through and vetted a ton of ton of vendors. You're going to see that on a, on a future slide here. Um, but it's important to understand, okay, Office 365, you can have um, archival mailboxes in exchange. You can have uh, OneDrive, I think, will stick around for about 90 days. User accounts will get deleted after 30 days after you perform a deletion there. And so it's really important to understand kind of the scopes of that, right? You know, SharePoint will have versioning control on, on their files. Again, important to know. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe you need to go back to a specific time, right? Maybe you need to roll it back 180 days and say, okay, what did the file look like, you know, in this person's OneDrive? Or, hey, this person was supposed to get an email and said that they didn't, but we need to verify and make sure that they didn't. And, and rolling back that to that Exchange mailbox. And so that's a feature set that is currently not yet available um, in GCC High is that a bit availability to roll back to a very specific date mm -hmm. um, and pull that out. Now, you can do some advanced things with e-discovery when it comes to mailboxes, and, and that's expanded to reach to SharePoint and Teams and things of that nature. Right. But from a long-term storage perspective, um, you're going to want to use a third-party tool like a, an AvPoint, which is what we've recommended here. Okay, yeah. So I, I, as, I, as I understand it, you can expand on some of these bullets here, but it needed to be not only the the location where backups were be, would be going to, mm -hmm. um, that that location needed to be FedRent moderate or FedRent moderate equivalent. Also, to the product itself, the SaaS application that would be doing the backups and how it handles uh, the data, right. obviously CUI, et cetera, it, that also, too, would need to be FedRent moderate. And and then that we, we kind of needed, because of most of our clients, some element of bring your own storage that they could basically select and not be relying upon the vendor's sure. storage or their own data center. Uh, and also, too, specifically, we needed folks to be able to store their data in Azure government mm -hmm. um, because, obviously, that is what we're most versed in and what we use most often. And also, too, that because some of our clients have ITAR data, needed to be a uh, U.S.-based company. Some of that was a little bit of preference, but yep. also, too, needed to be U.S.-based and also, too, from a support standpoint. So if something happened with their backup or had happened with the, the software that they were using, they may be getting support 
from somebody that is not U.S. based, not be a U.S. citizen, et cetera. Yep. And, and data sovereignty was such a huge, huge piece of our, our research. Did I, did I miss anything there? Anything no, you think I, I mean, should, should explain further? I mean, really kind of some of the highlights, right? And you see in the slide here, the Federant moderate, right? So um, there are some data centers out there that are not even Federant certified at all, right? You can't be Federant moderate equivalent. You have to be actually be Federant moderate. Oh, that's good. And yeah. so there's a little bit of a difference there. Now, when it comes to ITAR data, that, that kind of moves you into the Federant high space. Um, we are looking at, you know, the Azure Gov, ideally, um, kind of space to store everything. Again, Azure Commercial is also FedRAMP high. That, that's a recent addition as of a few months ago. Um, that's really important. Bring your own storage. Again, also important. Uh, bring your own encryption key, right? That's some, one thing that is also wow. good to talk about, right? The ability, if you want and have, you know, policy and understanding and your, your cyber team wants you to bring that, to bring your own uh, encryption key to the party, right? Um, all very important things to talk about. U.S. support is huge. It's incredibly hard to get U.S.-based support. Um, for, for many products. And so not only vetting, okay, where are you storing your application? Where's your application hosted? Is it a FedRAMP moderate, Fed, FedRAMP high? If you're using a SaaS application, you know, what kind of data center is it in? Um, but then also your U.S. support personnel. Um, because if you have somebody, um, you know, a foreign national trying to access your backup data to troubleshoot it for you, they could then potentially have access to ITAR or CUI data. Um, and it's very important to understand from a support perspective um, that they are U.S.-based citizens. And if not, request that. Some companies will allow you to do that. Um, some companies won't. And so, it, again, it's, it's really important to vet um, to the nth degree kind of all the vendors that you use for that particular perspective. Going into the down selection that we had, yep. kind of the bake-off that we had, looking at the, at the various vendors, when we looked at, Backing up from on-prem mm -hmm. uh, to some other cloud storage location, more or less, there was many, many companies that met that criteria yep. um, in a safe, secure, and compliant way. But then once you started getting into backing up GCC High, then that narrowed it down to Veeam and Avpoint, mm -hmm. as I understand it. And then ultimately, we decided on Avpoint, can you give some, some flavor to that uh, beyond, beyond just that? Yeah, so uh, the, like he said, the two that we kind of narrowed it down to were Veeam and um, Avpoint, which is the solution we ended up going with. Um, again, kind of going back a little bit, making sure that they're in a FedRAMP certified data center, you know, moderate or high if, if needed, depending on if you have the ITAR requirement, um, is, a, is a big one, U.S. support, you know, kind of going down that list that I just mentioned. The reason that we ended up picking um, uh, Avpoint, and this is, again, I think we decided on this vendor, I want to say 90 days ago, 180 days ago? Yeah, at least three or four months ago. Um, and so some of this might have changed, but as far as we're aware, none of it has, um, is that Veeam, um, their R&D department's actually based in Moscow. And so although they do have a license to work with the with the Army, um, we just decided it's probably best not to use someone that has a portion of their organization, um, such, a, such, a, such a large portion based out of a, of a Russian, uh, out of Russia. And so we decided to finally go with um, Avpoint, which is U.S. based. Um, they host their product out of the uh, U.S. Gov Virginia Data Center, mm -hmm. and then you can have U.S. Gov obviously data storage there as well. So it's a one-stop shop from not only the application access but also the storage access, and then their support is U.S. based. Yeah, and some of <clears throat> some of the nuances that we ran into where there were some companies that credibly could technically back up GCC high. They could do that. Right. But, you know, their their uh, software application did not meet the FedRAM standards that it needed to meet, or um, there was nuances to where it could store information, and it had to be on their data center, right. um, which was not, did not meet the compliance requirements, things of that nature. So, uh, so we, at that point, ultimately. Yeah. We were working with one company at one time doing the vetting process, and uh, they said that they could back up GCC High, which was great. Um, they were a Canadian-owned company, and all of their support was Canadian-based. Um, their platform was an AWS commercial, which is FedRAMP moderate. Um, so it was meeting some of the boxes, um, but we actually made it to the discussion point where they would have to hire U.S.-based staff in order to troubleshoot any backup issues. Mm -hmm. And so, again, very important, and I want you guys to understand as well, like, the, the links that we went to vet the products um, that, that, we, that we did are pretty extensive. Um, and it's something that I don't wish, wish upon anyone to have to do um, consistently, but it's something needed for compliance, right? And it's very important to uh, use compliant products. Um, just kind of how it is. Right on. So let's get into a little bit of a demo of AppPoint 
and what users can expect if they decide to go this route and uh, a little bit about what we deal with uh, from a day-to-day basis uh, using AvPoint sure. for, so for clients. Just kind of talking about it a little bit, AvPoint, um, the configuration is really easy. Mm-hmm. Um, you register an application inside of your Azure tenant. You give that very specific permission sets to be able to reach in and back up your Exchange and your SharePoint, your Teams data, um, your OneDrive data, things of that nature. And then you set up um, all the users, all the accounts you want to back up, the site collections you want to back up, you know, kind of going through, you know, methodically and, and understanding what you want to back up and checking those boxes. And then you you do a, you do a, basically a backup, right? So you start it off. The first backup, backup takes quite some time because it's actually backup, backing up all of that data as a point in time, which could be hundreds of gigs. It could be terabytes upon terabytes upon terabytes. So that first backup job might actually take a while. Yeah. But then after that, it's going to start doing um, incrementals every day. Um, and then it's going to save that for up to a year for you. And then you can continue on that process year after year, depending on how long you want to save the data. Perfect. So getting into the demo here of AppPoint in backing up Office 365, you see here, obviously the workloads exchange, OneDrive, SharePoint, et cetera, and where you can kind of control your backups. So to go into general settings, you can even control the storage location. So hypothetically, uh, this is a bring your own storage scenario. You don't necessarily want to use AvPoint's uh, data centers and their backup storage uh, natively. You want to go ahead and use whether it be AWS or Azure government or um, some other on-prem location. You can go ahead and click that there, remove backup from AvPoint. And you see here, there's storage type. Um, and as you click on this, uh, the storage type, and you may change that throughout. You can, you can obviously, it will uh, kind of react to whichever storage type you pick. So I'm going to go down here. And so let's say you decide to go uh, with Dropbox. So obviously, see, you can see credentials. Then you have retention period right here as well. And this goes for all of them. You can set retention period just from this. Test whether or not everything is connected properly based off the things that you configure and set. You see here, obviously, these change throughout. And then you can set access key, you know, bring your own key scenarios, things of that nature. And here we go in into encryption keys and being able to export those and control it in that manner. And uh, let's go ahead and get into being able to check on jobs after you do uh, do uh, a backup. So now that I've kind of shown you a little bit of the granularity and some of the control you can have over where you're backing up, how you're backing up, things of that nature, right here you can see uh, uh, the dashboard for all of your backups, and you can check on the jobs. You can even dig into specifically when you click on more details and things of that nature. You can click on more details and see uh, what exactly was the cause of a backup, uh, failing, what happened to that job, uh, when it failed, when was the last successful backup, all that kind of good stuff. So here you see uh, basically job analytics uh, per workload. You can see how many jobs have finished com- successfully, um, and you can look back as far as seven days, a week out, and also to all jobs that have ran this week, just to have a a quick look at status and do some diagnostics there. Here too, you can see just a different look at uh, how um, objects are being backed up and uh, specifically within each workload and successes, failures, et cetera. So here in job monitoring, you can really start looking at each individual job and you can even see if it was an automatic backup versus a manual backup. You can see obviously date, time, et cetera, how long it took. You can even generate a report. So let's say uh, you're going going into some sort of review uh, or meeting within your team. You can kind of export some of these to uh, discuss amongst your team as, as far as what's being backed up, whether or not we need to back up certain data, um, any anomalies, things of that nature. 
All right, and that about wraps it up. I just wanted to show a quick snapshot into what is available uh, in in the user interface specifically. Obviously, it takes a little bit more work to get the uh, get the product set up and get it tapped into your tenant and backing up the right things. Um, and obviously, as Daniel alluded to, the first time you're going to back something up, it's going to take much longer. But then after the fact, once everything's set up, then it's just a matter of coming in into either one of these dashboards um, and kind of messing around and, and finding your way through it. It's pretty self-explanatory. Um, I don't do backups on a regular basis. But, uh, but nevertheless, it's, it's pretty easy to navigate, and that's more or less what I wanted to, to show everybody that's in attendance today. Otherwise, go ahead and check out cmmc.blog. That is a, a quick link to get to our blog, and you'll see one of, one of our most recent, which is covering some of the material that we covered today, but uh, going a little bit more extensively and mapping it to each requirement uh, within levels two and three. So if you want to go ahead and check that out, uh, again, that's cmmc.blog, and it's a, and the, the latest blog will be about recovery and some of the things that we've discussed today. But again, look out for the recording as well. And if you have further questions or you want a, a more extensive demo on AppPoint and what it can do in terms of backing up GCC High, uh, feel free to reach out. You can reach out to our team at cmmc at summit7systems.com. Again, that's cmmc at summit7systems.com. And we would be happy to follow up with any additional questions, uh, whether Daniel and Daniel or I or another one of our team members can address. So thanks again for attending today. Uh, we appreciate the questions and all of your feedback throughout the whole process. And uh, signing off here from Summit 7 headquarters at uh, the Summit 7 Studios. Man, we like alliteration.